All right, so today is the 18th of July, 2014. My name is Raffaele Polito, and this interview is for the Mingai London Institute, British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project. So could I begin by asking your name? Uh, my name is Raymond Chow. And where were you born? Born in Hong Kong. Um, tell me a little bit about your family. My family, I um, I come here single. I was a student when I came over in 1971. And then the, I have an English wife before, got two kids. And after that, I have a Chinese wife. So together, I have three children, three boys. What about your family back to Hong Kong? My family back to Hong Kong, you mean my parents? Yes, your parents. Uh, they're all gone now. <laughs> no longer here, but my, I still got a brother okay. uh, in Hong Kong and a sister married to uh, um, Malaysia. Right. Married Malaysia, yeah. So this is my family. And back in Hong Kong, uh, what work did your mother and father do? Uh, to be honest, I, I can just vainly remember because I was very young, I was studying uh, high school and then uh, polytech in Hong Kong. At those times, uh, my mother was doing some plastics business. It's a sort of, uh, uh, if you like, it's like um, manufacturing some plastics. But we are not the manufacturer. I think we do some additional work on the plastic to make it into a product. That's what I can remember. Okay. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about your educational background? Um, I finished my high school in Hong Kong, and then I went to Polytech uh, to do, we call it dyeing, printing, and finishing. At that time, um, it was difficult to get into a university, really. And I thought uh, to go to Polytech is as good. So when I was doing this course, I found out it was not my cup of tea anyway. You know, the reason I, do, I tried to do that course was it was very good wage in working in a factory like that. So I left. I... Um, the only place I can think of coming, of going to study, is United Kingdom because I only got one friend who was my colleague uh, uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, he told me, he said, Raymond, Charter Accountants is a good course. So I thought, why not? That's why I come here at 1971. Right. Um, so exactly what what was it that motivated you to leave your country and come to the UK it's very simple we just we're looking for better prospect in working in the future because at, at, at my age at that time you just try to, to search if you like. I don't even know why why, why I was doing child accountants people say it, it's a good job you know so you come here and think taking a chance okay you know I would take this course then because I was not even I did not even know what thing I should do in the future at that time. And did you arrive straight to Manchester or Yeah. I catch a plane to come to Manchester and then immediately I worked for a Chinese uh, accountancy firm. Okay. What were your first impressions of the UK and specifically in Manchester? Manchester side? Well, at that time uh I was living in YMCA, so you have the breakfast and the dinner there, and then you, you know, you mix with a lot of people. And um, the time I, I'm thinking now is 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 very behind. To be honest, I mean, uh, if you compare Hong Kong, the working condition with Hong Kong and here is very behind. It's very, very. I won't say relaxed, but I think we were. Quite, quite lazy, really. 
People were very lazy. At my time, when I come here, all the shops close about five o'clock in the in the evening. Do you know what I mean? But in Hong Kong, it's 24 hours. So you really got to get used to it. When you come here, my God, you close at half at five o'clock. You know where you're going. But anyway, I come here to study. So I try to improve my English or whatever things, examinations at that time, like uh, doing charter accountants, you need to study as well because we call it as an audit program. You, you know, you, you need to to do a lot of study to face examination because I was doing charter accountants then. That means you got to work daytime with an accountancy firm and then you got to study at night. So basically this is what we do when we come. Okay, and um, how long have you owned your business? And can you tell me when you founded it? Um, <clears throat> my career changed because I worked for a Chinese accountancy firm first, and then I thought there was not much prospect in it. Uh, I didn't earn a lot. So when I came here one year, I became the office manager um, of the Chinese accountancy firm. But at that time, um, I thought I, I could not earn en learn enough from the accountancy firm. So I changed to an English firm then. It's a Jewish firm, accountancy, it's called Dang M. Jeffy. So I worked for another firm for, I think, two years or so in accountancy. And then I found out it was not my cup of tea as well. So I left the firm. I uh, start do I start doing uh, bookkeeping business, travel business because when I came, the first accountancy firm I said the Chinese firm was doing a travel agent as well. So I became a travel agent myself. I started with uh, as a, 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 um, a business selling agent. At that time, there was not a business selling agent. So I start with uh, looking for chip shops because at that time, clients said, can you find me a chip shop? Can you find that they don't, they don't know where to find it? So I find it, it, was, I find it interesting. So I become an agent at that time. And um, at 1978, it's the first business I start with. And it was doing like, uh, uh, as I said, a business transfer agent, a bookkeeping business, and a travel business. So I start with that, 1978. It's, it's, a, it's a time I opened my business. Just before that, I was doing film business as well. That means any films from Hong Kong, they sent to London, and I was an agent to take those films to different cinemas and uh, you know just rent the films and it was part of the business at that time. And uh, yeah, that was 1978. So by 1980, uh, I was running uh, an office. It's a change of uh, a business as well. Uh, in addition to that, I was doing, uh, we call it video business. At that time, no one knows about video. So it was an uh, a, a sort of incident. You found this is a good business, and uh, at that time, honestly, I can only afford to buy a television, uh, one or two video tapes, and I thought, oh, it's a good business. So you try to ask, I try to ask my clients to come in, look, have a look. They said, wow, this is television. I said, no, this is video. What is video? Nobody know about it. So it was very expensive as well, video tapes at that time. Cost I think about 12 pounds, 15 pounds per video tape. Not now, it's only one pound you can get video, but at that at those times. So we charge a deposit for the clients because we have to pay royalty, we call it, to, to the supply of the video. So it started at uh, 90, 90, 1979, I think, yeah, at that time. And I was doing import and export business as well. well. Actually, it's import. I import some watches from Hong Kong. And uh, 
I went to France, tried to sell it, went to London, tried to sell it. It's basically uh, a salesman's business, really. So I tried everything, but very unfortunately, um, I lost I lost every of the business really about 1981. Um, I, my business really was, was done. I was doing very, very good business, to be honest. Um, is I changed my business. I went to to join uh, Humbro Life, which is a life company and uh, selling life insurance, savings, or investment, and you know, all this. So 1971, I joined the company, and um, I started with that business then. At that time, I changed my profession, and I was doing good at that time. Okay. And so what have, uh, the main challenge has been in establishing this business, the one that you currently have and run. The challenge. At 1981 when I joined Humble Life, uh, I actually was very, up when I was doing a very, very, very good business and all of a sudden I, I lost my car in a way because I was losing quite a lot of money at the same time as well and I ran a very big office at that time actually two floors uh, when I say was making good money was uh, making over 1,000 pounds per week at that time I was the first one very young to drive a Mercedes at that time but it was unknown so the car was taken away really yeah, yeah remember so when you become a salesman uh, I went for an interview with, we call it Humble Life, which is, which belongs to Zurich now. Uh, Zurich took over, I mean, in the later years. Humble Life changed to um, um, another life company, and then later on it was taken over by Zurich. Well, it's a, it's a, a long history, I don't want to mention so much. What I, what, what I did was, I joined in Humble Life, was doing good, I was traveling everywhere, um, we call it prospecting, if you like. So you have to go to see clients to all the chip shops, uh, restaurants, whether they're in Manchester, Liverpool, London, um, Edinburgh or Belfast, I travel everywhere to do my business. It was very hard business, but it was good money. So from that time, 1981, I changed my profession, and between 1981 to now, is from a, a, a financial advisor I was in, and then you start with mortgage business and start with, you know, um, you've got to have a connection with commercial business with the banks, so you need to create a lot of context to do this business, and really you got to learn everything, I mean with the, we call it compliance, you know, you really got to study to catch up with all the, all the information every year, and uh, on night 2001, uh, 2001, uh, I start another business called immigration business. And I think I was the first, the first ones, not many at that time to join in with, we call it OISC, which is a, a, a sort of a, a profession, if you like, to join in there. And I was lucky because at that time, we were the very first one to join in this uh, um, OISC, we call it. Uh, we were approved to do immigration business and uh, I then had to go to China, um, Hong Kong and China for the last 10 years. I need to see the clients, I need to recruit chefs from China to come here to work for, 
United Kingdom, the, the restaurant owners and takeaways, whatever. You know, so I was very busy for 10 years. Okay. And what this, did this immigration business involve? So what, what, what did... What were you, your main duties? So you were going to, you were working mainly with with Chinese people. Yeah. And you were helping them to come to the yes. UK and find them a job. Yeah. All right. That means at that time you really got to know the restaurant owners here, the takeaway owners there. Knowing the requirement, like uh, oh, they don't need to speak English, but as far as they know how to work in the kitchen, you know, but. To be honest, I did not even know what the kitchen staff, what, what they should do. So I made my way to the restaurant, asked the owners, you know, asked the head chef, what, what, what do you do in the restaurant? What, what, actually in the kitchen, what do you do? They got a lot of names for it, like head chef, second chef, whatever chef, south chef, whatever. I didn't even know about that. I was only a customer. So I learned from them. And then I went to China, and then you look for, <clears throat> then you find out uh, many Chinese, they want to come here. Uh, they don't have the knowledge of, uh, of cooking. So I started uh, uh, a catering school there as well. I actually has, have employed a, surf, a head chef from Manchester here, go back to China to coach them, if you like, and uh, to make sure they know how to do commercial Chinese food before they come over. If I mention commercial, that means like uh, people here, English people here, they like sweet and sour chicken, but in China you don't have that sort of things. Do you know what I mean? Like fried rice, uh, noodles and all this. I mean, it's in different style. So when I employ a chef in China, I make them to know how to make this sort of food before they actually allowed to come over here. So then when they come over here, they can get used to do the work very easily. So I was quite busy for 10 years in doing this business. And then the government changed the rules now. So we, we, we lost that business, not totally, but we still do immigration line to apply for a parent to come, um, to apply for f family to join them. I mean, you know, all these sort of things uh, like to apply uh, permanent residence. Mm. We're still doing this business. It's not a lot, but just keep us working. Um, can you briefly talk about the Lion Club of Manchester? Uh, what is this <laughs> organization? I joined in Lions Club, we call it. I found the uh, United uh, 25 years ago as a member. And at that time, it was for some professional people I was remember. Then actually, it doesn't apply to all the, really apply to professional people. As far as you are enthusiastic in helping people, we call it helping people who are less fortunate than ourselves. I think it's, uh, I think it's a very good way to help the community. So every time we just, every year, we raise some money to help like people in um, in here, like the old people's home, if they need something and they don't have the money, we're trying to raise the money. I've, we've been raising money for the hospitals here as well. Um, all the time we're talking about raising funds to help people who are less fortunate than ourselves. All the money we raise, uh, we either send to China but they, let's say they got an earthquake in China or India or wherever. So, uh, Nance Club basically we have a meeting, we talk about where we, we should donate our money, you know. So, this is the project we've been all, all the time to see whether, you know, where we should uh, distribute our money where we can raise them. And what about the Chinatown Business Association? What is your role in? Uh, I was the I was the chairman uh, of the Biz China China Business Association for eight, for eight years. All the time uh, is more or less a group of um, uh, 
Chinese business people like their restaurant owners, uh, maybe accountants, different um, uh, uh, occup occupations. I mean, they could be the owner of a take a, uh, not the take away now. In Chinatown, it's more or less any people who's in business in Chinatown. We sit down, we talk about the security of Chinatown. We talk about how we develop. Uh, we talk about cut calling. Uh, I mean, whether there's prostitution here, how can we get rid of that? So we work with the police as well. Uh, well, actually, it's the encouragement from police, not ourselves. They invite us for meetings. Um, yeah, basically, this is what what we did. It's a sort of communication uh, between uh, our business people and with the police as well to make sure we we are very safe in, in, in doing business in Chinatown. We also try to communicate with London, Birmingham as well, but we don't go very far. We add, Most of the time we just concentrate in Chinatown, in Manchester. Okay, and um, we know that you are also involved in the Federation of Chinese Association of, of Manchester. Yeah. Um, and what I want to ask you is what, what motivates you to be so involved in the Chinese community and uh, also in relation to the, the um, Federation of Chinese Association of Manchester? <coughs> it was just an incident really. I was invited to join the Federation of Chinese Association and because I think, uh, I think they think I'm a good person, a good candidate to be the, the chair. So at one time I was a chair for this Federation of Chinese Association. Uh, it's, it's, sort, it's sort of a uh, uh, communication of our community with China as well. But uh, Federation of Chinese Association means there's so many of the, our organizations like uh, uh, Manchester China Business Association, they got so many associations to join together. So it formed the Federation of Chinese uh, Association. It's more or less a, a representation of all organizations to communicate with the uh, Chinese embassy here. Uh, I don't know, I was one of them. Uh, Elected to be the chair there, was having meetings with them, also talking about raising money to help China, also talk about politics, but I'm not good in politics. I'm, I won't say I'm not good in politics. I'm not keen in politics, if you get it right. Because most of the time I like uh, um, our Manchester China Town Lions Club, we never talk about politics. So it's very embarrassed situation, really. But I've been, I was the chair there for, for one year or so. Mm. Right. Um, about um, Chinatown in Manchester, how do you think it has developed over the years? When I came uh, at 1931, there's no Chinatown here. You can see, you know, you can see Manchester here now. Uh, when I came here, there was only uh, two or three restaurants. They were house, a little bit outside Chinatown as well. So uh, I remember when I come here, one restaurant I went to, it, it cost 80 pence for for this of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, roast pork and rice and whatever. I thought, bloody hell, very, very expensive. 80 pence. Now we're talking about eight pounds now. You can imagine. Do you know what I mean? So, and then um, people try to cluster together, if you know what I meant. Chinese, they cluster together. That means like, oh, we need to open another restaurant. So, like Yang Sing at that time uh, was a very, very small restaurant that, you know, at that time. And uh, I was, as I said, I was a business agent as well. So I introduced Yang Sing. I said, look, you know, have this one, have this premises better. And then we got hairdressers, for example. 
these hairdressers from London, they ring, uh, we want to be a hairdresser, uh, we want to do a business in Manchester. So I help them to get the premises, you know, and then they start with the first hairdresser. But now you can see there's about 10 hairdressers in Manchester City Centre at my time. At my time, there's only one, and I'm the one who get them into here. So I, I, I think I will contribute in helping them you look for premises as well. Do you know what I mean? And that was how Chinatown was built. Then we start with, there's no, uh, no Chinese supermarket. And then they start with very small business like uh, importing some goods from Hong Kong, some food stuff from Hong Kong to here to sell. And then it started with nothing really. Um, we buy rice from an Indian guy to now. They, they know how to do all the import and export now. Like, you know, it was developed very gradually at that time. And uh, I'm surprised now there's about maybe 100 business in Chinatown now consists of supermarkets, solicitors, accountants, uh, hairdressers, uh, all sort of business now, develop into now. And it was a bit, I think it's a, a bit, we come to a sort of saturation at the moment. Uh, it, it, it won't, uh, there's a lot of reasons now it's been quiet down because I think we've got enough restaurants at the moment now, people say um, buffet business is good, so that immediately there are another three or four new buffet restaurants starting with. It's just, I think it's a new gimmick if you like in business. But if it's de developing in this way, and uh, the Chinese in Manchester now, they try to develop like a restaurant business a little bit outside Manchester because most of the re major reason it could be the parking problem as well. Those, the, so they start with a supermarket uh, with free parking space, and then they have a restaurant above the supermarket. Uh, I think it attracts a lot of Chinese then uh, for the convenience um, of parking, eating, and shopping at the same time for the right restaurant to take away. This is how it's developed. Okay. And uh, what do you think are uh, the main challenges at the moment for the Chinese community in Manchester? The challenge? I think, uh, um, I think, as I mentioned before, people they are in restaurant business, they want to, uh, to make sure they keep themselves busy, is they can find a restaurant with parking space in Chinatown. It's very costly to park in Chinatown because like, I'll give you an example. Like if I eat a restaurant or uh, for lunch with my family, I got three sons. So when I park my car, it costs me maybe uh, uh, 10 pounds to park the car for two hours um, in, in a restaurant. So my three sons will come with three, three cars as well. Yeah, and maybe the girlfriend come as well, and maybe my wife come with another car. The parking fee could cost easily fifty to sixty pounds, you know. But the money you spend in the restaurant is more or less the same amount of money. So more or less, like if the restaurant cost me sixty quid, with the parking totally cost one hundred and twenty pounds. So the challenge is, if a Chinese restaurant owner have a have as a restaurant is free of um, parking is free of charge, and then you do all the shopping, um, and then you do all the shopping in so we mentioned about challenge, I think it's down to the restaurant owners how they operate their business really, especially the supermarkets. They like to find a place, free parking, they like to start a restaurant above that. Um, it, it could attract a lot of um, restaurant owners, takeaway owners, they would go to that place to do shopping and eating at the same time. Uh, like one of them, like Wing Yip, they, in the premises they got 
solicitors, accountants, they got offices set up there as well for the convenience of Chinese people. Okay. Um, now we're going to ask you some questions about your personal um, view of, uh, of uh, living in the UK. Um, what is the best thing about your job? What is the best thing about my job is my job is very flexible. So if I don't want to work for, if I want to work to, to start my work at, uh, let's say, 11 o'clock in the morning, it's flexible. Uh, but when I say the flexibility there, but to work in this business, you need to to have a lot of patience, if you like. Uh, there's a lot of pressure in it as well because we're talking about compliance. We've got to catch up with all the rules of the government and... Uh, 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 and uh, we call it financial authority, you know. And uh, my job is very, very difficult in a way because you need to spend a lot of time in making things right. It's not like those old days now. You get, let's say, my business is a more. I'm a mortgage advisor as well. And my days, talking about 20 years ago, you just find a lender. Let's say uh, the uh, Nationwide Building Society, Halifax. You just go there and say, uh, I'm, I'm working, uh, I have a wage of this. And then you get the mortgage very easily. These days now, it's very difficult because the rules has been changed. We talk about uh, MMR two months ago. We call it Market Market Review. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we insist to look at the income and expenditure so if your income is very high, but you spend a lot of money, you don't get a mortgage. But if you, uh, you and the land, some of the lenders said, no, you need to have twenty-five thousand pounds of minimum income before we grant you a mortgage, or you grant you a buy-to-let mortgage, whatever. So really, you got to when when Chinese people come to talk to you, uh, every case is different. You really got to know everything. Uh, to make sure that, well, I won't say to make sure, to try our best to get them a mortgage. Um, takes a lot of time. So that's why very often I work very late as well to make sure we get the lender for them and we satisfy the lender. All the documentations, documentations require proof of income, proof of whatever things. You need to get everything. You need to scan them. You've got to send to the lender before they actually give you a mortgage offer. This is how bad the business is at the moment. So would you say that's the worst part about your job? The worst part about my yeah. job? Well, to be honest, I uh, I love my job. I won't say worst part. Sometimes I work until 10, 10 o'clock at night. I think if I'm going to make money, I deserve it, put it that way. <laughs> uh, because I spend so much time in it. But people won't know that you spend so much time because... We, in our business now, we need, let's say somebody coming for a mortgage, you need, you need to do a fact find on them. It costs you two hours, three hours to understand them. A fact find means to understand the client. And then on the specific circumstances, you have to find, we, we, have to, we say we're going to source a lender. That means from our computer, we will find a lender that will prepare to lend the money to this prospect. And then my duty is to get the cheapest rate in the market, otherwise we'll be in trouble. Yeah, I mean, like if Halifax charges 1.98% and I find a lender charges 2%, then we've got to give a lot of explanation why. But uh, the difficulty about this business now is, as people know the rate, of interest is going to go up by Bank of England. So that means, uh, before we talk about um, two years fix is good for the clients because after two years, they can still ask for a product. Uh, we call it fixed rate product, from maybe from Halifax, from another lender. But now, it's not the proper advice now. It should be three year to five years fix because we all anticipate that the interest rate will be increasing for these coming few years. 
So to be a, a competent advisor, you really got to know everything. You talk to the client and let, you just we call it we give the information and let the client to decide which way they want to go. So all these sort of things is uh you know, um before when we get a mortgage offer, it may take two weeks. But now it may take two months or three months. So this is the sort of business we are in. Mm, about your Chinese heritage, how does it affect your work and life in the UK? My Chinese character. Heritage. Your Chinese culture. Well, uh, the reason I, I have so many Chinese uh, customer is because I, I speak the language and uh, we, underst we understand each other's. I mean, as soon as they mention something before they say to the end, I understand what, what, we did, what they want. So uh, it is communications, really. I mean, like uh, my son is working with me now, but uh, hardly he can communicate with the older generation. And uh, they're all English way anyway all English speaking, so they were BBC here, born here, so he got his own clients, but my client base is older generation, we talk to them, the older generation will say, look, they tell the, 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 the children, come to see Raymond, Uncle Raymond now, you know, can help to sort out, so actually, it, 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 it's the way you understand them before you can do business, if you understand what I mean, if you don't understand them, you won't have the time to do business with them at all. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, how important is, is uh, Chinese culture and your heritage to you? Um, how, how do you incorporate this into your daily life in a British environment? Um. What what I can say is, I, because I speak Cantonese, I speak Mandarin as well, um, and the uh, very first thing I do is, when I communicate them with very well, with a fact fine, and then you you ought, you need to um, put them all together into English ways as well to satisfy um, English companies as well. So. It is the way uh, you translate them into English, really. So on one side, we've got to do the compliance, we've got to do everything to make sure from the English way of looking at the thi on the things, you know, make sure we comply with them. At the same time, when you talk to a Chinese, uh, to make sure the information I require is what is required from the from the other side as well, so it's a sort of things you need to build up yourself, yeah. So when I do the fact find, when I do the business, I start like when I'm talking to you, understand you very well. I don't like to write down, ah, oh, hello, what's your name, and start with a, we call it fact find, and really make it people think, my God, what you're doing on me? Are you, are you coming from the Yenna Revenue? Are you, you know, you, you know, you know, why you ask so many things? So if you start talking with them, and I say you know them very well, you talk to them, you understand them, or very often I let them go, as soon as they're gone, I write down all the things we talk about, so make sure I won't forget things. That is the way we do business with Chinese people. Um, what parts of your culture, traditions, and Chinese heritage do you feel are the most, are, are most important to teach to your children? To my children, yeah. Uh, let's face the let's, let's face the fact. All the Chinese that come from Hong Kong or China, the younger generation, the children will be very English anyway. So the only way you can do it is, let's say, uh, um, I will encourage uh, my children to go for Chinese education, like uh, they only go for every every Sunday to learn some Chinese. Basically, as a father, I want them to learn Chinese language as well. But they only earn a little bit of it. But the only way we can 
we can make them to speak Chinese is, is why we are at home, I use Chinese all the time to talk to them. I don't care about English, I just talk to them everything in Chinese now. So my youngest son now, able to speak Chinese and English very well, my the other two elder sons is because they used to live with the mother, they all English speak. It's no problem for me to speak Chinese to them because none of them will understand me at all. So that is the way it is, you know, really. I, I believe, you know, younger generation, all, they will all speak English. Yeah, and other generation, other words as well. So it's, it's the way it's going forward. Um, and how does your work fit with your, fit in with your personal life? My personal life? How do you balance? I don't know how to balance because when I was young, I was very energetic. I do everything because to me, it's a challenge to do any business. I try everything. But now when you become aged now, old now, you try to, uh, you try to make sure you're safe in business. So uh, the only thing I can say is when you, when you say you're professional in the business, that means you, you have been doing that business for a long time. You call yourself professional or you're recognized as a professional. So the only thing I can say is um, any change in sort of things we do, we try to study it, remember it, try to make good use of it to make sure. I mean, it costs me a lot. It costs you a lot of time um, to... to to um, to make sure you fully understand the business, and I don't have much of personal time now, but I still have time. Like uh, uh, talk to my Chinese friends, like uh, oh, let's have a game of Chinese dominoes. We call it Ma Joint. So it's a way to relax yourself, maybe uh, maybe for a few hours uh, in a week, and you know, and that is only uh, only entertainment, if you like. I got other than that. Uh, I think I get used to the life here now. Work, uh, pay a little bit more joy, watch Chinese television if you like. Uh, there's a time I pass every day or I talk to my sons, you know, on, on a specific day like on a Saturday. When they're not working, we all gather together to have a, a lunch. That's, that's how I pass my time. I, won't, I don't have any, any particular way. I mean, I travel. A lot, but because I just have an operation on my hip, so I stop my traveling. But my son still going to traveling. That is the way they enjoy their life. But I think it's good because I wish, if I were them, to have so much time um, and and uh, uh, no money problem to go out as well. But I think uh, uh, I need to work very hard to make sure I I'm able I, I can afford my retirement. People say, oh, wait a minute, why, why don't you retire? I say, I haven't got enough money to retire. I wish if I could. So it's all the time you try to, you know, make sure you can um, um, earn enough money to pass your time. That's what my business at the moment is. What, um, these are just the last few questions. What are the aspirations that you have for your children, for your three sons? Do you know, as a father, you just want to make sure, you just wish that they uh, they don't come forward to say, hey, Daddy, I'm in trouble, can you lend me uh, uh, 100 pounds or 1,000 pounds to do this? You just wish all of them, they can make the living well. So the only worry, aspiration is maybe, uh, like personally, my, my son is, Doing, the elder son is doing very, very good, and uh, his wife said he's making uh, 75,000 baht a year for flipping that. Very, very good, and they're changing a house, and you just feel mm, it's very successful. You don't need to talk to them about business then, because you will think to yourself, it's better than myself. Then you start spending time with the second son, it's not uh, in any professional business or whatever. You start talking to them, uh, you care for them. What, 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 are you gonna, what, what do you think you're going to do uh, in the future? Uh, are you happy with your job now? So you start asking questions and encourage them. Um, 
to be steady in the business, really. And then, uh, let's say you come to the, 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 my youngest son is in my business, and then you really got to see whether he is actually, whether he's pretending uh, to do work with you well or actually put his heart in his business. So what I think, what I think to myself is, is it, is it better to work with me or is it better to go to the bank or go to the building society to work? Is it actually his cup of tea to work as well? Because whether it's be successful or not, you've got to put your heart in it to be successful. So I won't expect anything from them. I just talk to them, try to understand them, and, I, and then I stop because I don't want to, to give my opinion all the time. They're growing, growing up now. That is their life. Let them make the decision themselves. This is my way of look at it. I don't know. I mean, anything they do, if they're interested in it, I said, work hard on it. You get somewhere. That's what I can tell them. Okay. Um, is there anything else you would like to discuss or mention? No, my friend. I think I tried to answer your every <laughs> question. I don't have anything. I'm not prepared on anything. You just ask me things, I will tell you, give me an answer. All right, then, uh, that's the end of our interview. Thank you very much for particip participating in our project and sharing your memories. Okay. Thank you very that's much. That's fine, thank you. I hope it's a bit helpful to you. I don't know. It surely is.